to go the whole way and win the, the biggest TV show in the UK was just just mad, really. This changed me, maybe more humble and more appreciative of the UK public, you know, and just walking around with a smile on my face. What you've achieved in sport is global, right? You've won probably, is it the second most races ever? 59 races? Four World Superbike titles and two TTF one world titles and an endurance world title. I remember waking up and hearing a hel helicopter noise and I was in and out of consciousness. I was, I'd, I'd, I'd crashed in a place where you wouldn't normally crash. I clipped another rider in front of me. Were you not scared? I'm just scared of not winning, really. Would you say that she's your soulmate? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yes, she's my mate, yes, yeah, she's yeah. best mate. You need that person, really, to enjoy the good times, but also, you know, the bad times are, are, are quite often as well, really, and felt shoulder to cry on. I suffer quite badly with, with anxiety and I get depressed and stuff. And, you know, and, and I, I think what I've got around me, it should never be like that. Would you feel like you find it difficult to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, with someone I didn't know, yeah, definitely. Even just saying what I've just said now, I just instantly feel a bit better, you know. Do you know what? I've seen you change throughout the conversation. Do you ever take a step back? and appreciate what you've actually achieved. Do you ever feel proud of what you've done? I think I do now, yeah. I look back and think, I did all right, didn't I? <laughs> Welcome back to another brand new episode of Learning As I Go, sponsored by British Triathlon. We are back in the OG location today, the Stock Exchange Hotel, and we are joined by a phenomenal guest, MBE, Carl Fogarty. This guy is a legend of the superbike sport and he has won multiple world championships. But he has done so much more than that. He's created an amazing life for himself. He's won I'm a Celebrity in 2014. And he opens up today about his battle with mental health, his winning mentality, and so much more. This is going to be one hell of a conversation. So make sure you sit back, tune in, and get ready for another life lesson with learning as I go. Carl Fogarty, welcome, mate. Oh, yeah. Welcome oh, yeah. to the studio. Nice I'm Carl Fogarty on Learning As You Go, I think. Learning podcast. As I Go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. That'll do. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> We're always learning. Carl, welcome to the studio. So I've just been informed by my team that you are potentially the most famous person I've had on my podcast. And I think I've got to agree. Struggling uh, for famous people then, mate, aren't you? Well, no, I'm not, you know. It's just because you, what you've achieved in sport is global, right? And even I knew of you before you did the jungle and everything else because you've achieved so much um, in the superbike sport, right? You've won probably, is it the second most races ever? 59 races? Yep, 59, yes. And don't, Should have been more. Don't quote me on this, is it four um, world championships? Four world superbike titles and two TTF one world titles and an endurance world title as well. And can I, just seven say, all together. can I just say, how are you still alive? I don't know. I've been doing the TT for um, for a few years. I did it, and how I went around the TT circuit and to win that place and uh, set the lap record, and which stood for seven years. I'm quite lucky to be here, to be fair. Yeah, and it's, that's what I mean. Seven years of relentless racing, and probably I don't think it's a, a more dangerous sport. Would you agree? Uh, possibly not. No, not really. Um, I mean, obviously the TT that's an, an exception. That's different racing than short circuit racing, which is obviously a lot safer than, than the TT, but. Um, no, it's probably up there with the most dangerous sports, I guess. That's what I mean. Even like Formula One, you're, like, you're protected by a car. Yeah, when yeah. you're out there on a bike. Yeah. And listen, I, I grew up on um, crosses when I was a kid. Oh, okay. um, and I had a horrible accident when I was about 25 and I snapped my leg and everything else. Really? But So basically, the reason why I'm saying that is not to put people off bikes and stuff, but I just know how dangerous they can be. Oh, I've had a few injuries. I've had a lot of injuries. I broke my leg a few times, three times when I was road racing. Uh, I also grew up on motocrosses as well, sort of doing schoolboy motocross for a couple of years before I went to uh, went to road racing. But one thing I noticed about um, real like sort of motorbikers is it doesn't matter if you get injured, all you want to do straight away is get straight back on your bike. Yeah, there's something in, in us that um, kind of just, it's just out, whenever you're injured, it's kind of, you know, when can I get back on the bike again? You know, when, when once the pain's gone away, you, you want to get back on the bike as soon as possible. So, so where did that love start for motorbiking? Because I know that your dad was um, yeah, a, a professional as well, wasn't he? My dad, he wasn't professional, but he, he raced motorbikes. Um, so I was brought up as a kid. All my childhood memories really are of going, all to, going to the races with him, to the local races like at Alton Park and, 
an A in tree and stuff, and then getting two weeks off school to go to the TT every year. It was like our family holiday going to the the, uh, the Alaman TT races, where he raced every year. Um, so it was in the blood, really. I think whatever you get brought up around as a kid, then chances are you're gonna you're gonna do that for a hobby or a profession, as it turned out for me. So um, yeah, the, the love of Wanting to race bikes came from my dad racing. Really, it's just yeah. funny you say that because um, I was just, I was just about to say what happened to Danielle and Claudia then because I don't think they'll be riding bikes anytime soon. No, no, two girls they they won't too bother about bikes. Uh, it's more kind of fashion and, and clothes for them to um, as it still is. Uh, yeah, but no, they, they they had little bikes and they were when they were kids, a little quad and stuff like that. But uh, no, they, they didn't really show much interest in wanting to be a next world champion. So t- tell <laughs> me about your first experience as a kid because I remember my first time on a motorbike and it's there's something so special about. It. like where did you really find that love for being out on a bike like can you remember the first time you did it or or that that passion uh i remember the first the first bike i ever got for me i've still got it at home actually the first little monkey bike when i was sort of nine or ten years old and um, they dead low ones, yeah, dead ones. Little I small, like a homemade thing it was really with a little honda 50 cc engine in and uh Yes, my dad showed me how to ride that, and it wasn't going too well at first. I went straight straight at the end of the garden, hit this like bit of a statue at the end of the garden, <laughs> put me off for about ten minutes. Um, but yeah, it was just it was just learning to ride on on the, on, the, on the garden that we had a small garden. And we moved to a bigger a bigger house and had some land at the back, and I was riding bikes around the fields all the time. I just loved coming home from school and getting on my bike and going around the fields and stuff. You know, it was just um, yeah, I just loved it. It's all I wanted to do as a kid. Really. And then, yeah. what age did you start racing? What was your first professional? Or not professional was, race, but um, just any race. A fifth, I was quite late, really. Um, school went motocross. I, I, I didn't want to... I, I was too I, I'm too shy, too scared, too embarrassed to, to enter a race, you know. I wish my dad had pushed me a little bit harder um, when I was younger to, to, to race. And I thought, if, if I come last, I'll not be able to accept that, you know what I mean? I'd be too embarrassed. And so I didn't race until I was like... 15 really it was like last two years of being at school um i, I did school by motocross uh and did all right finished sort of third in the championship that year in the, in the local club championship and stuff as soon as i was, eight, I was 18 now I, I switched to road racing i rode my dad's bike and it, it, my dad's last ever year of racing was 83 and that was my kind of 18th year and uh i rode his bike in um in some races in, in local races like at aintree and alton park and, and cadwell and stuff um to get rid of the orange jackets, start racing in '94, the '84 seasons on, on a full season on a on a 250 Yamaha. Um, so yeah, but as soon as I went to road racing, I really wanted to win that first ever race. I had the orange jacket on and everything. I was really pumped up, and uh, I was desperate to win the race. Really was, and uh, I finished second uh, in my first ever race and got disqualified for using uh, for dangerous riding as, as for one of one of the reasons um but i also use electric start it's only small and to try and start this ducati formula through ducati it was really difficult to bump start it was always bump starts then the, the, the flag would drop and you push and boom jump on the bike oh, really? and, wow. and go it didn't set off with the, the engine running you know so i i i was that nervous i drew out the hat number 36 or something so i was 36 on the grid at the back of row of the grid and all my family are watching at Aintree and stuff. My grandma was there watching and, and that. And as a guy, I lifted the flag up. I just pressed the button and just set off. <laughs> and I went from the back row of the grid to leading the race before I got into the, in the first turn. So I, my dad and everybody kind of went, oh, I'd say, what is he doing? <laughs> I made it a bit obvious that I use electric start. So, but I was, I, I was, you know, dicing for the lead and I'm back to fourth at one point and, I came through and I finished second. I was like, really pleased, you know, I'd done, I'd done so well. And, and then when I got disqualified, I was, I was heartbroken, to be honest. Yeah, I was gutted. <laughs> wow. So would you say then, um, as a kid, that you were naturally gifted on a bike or was it something that you really worked hard at? No, I wasn't really, no. I wasn't, I didn't have natural talent like a lot of guys did, but I was so determined and my focus and uh, you know, my de- determination, um, our obsession with winning um, just came. I don't know where it came from. That really, it wasn't. Um, my dad was never really like that. He just loved racing. My dad, it was just a, a hobby for him, expensive hobby at, at that. But um, I don't know where it came from. I, even at school, when I played football and we got beat, I was like, I, I couldn't stand it. Me, I, I, you know, the other guys didn't, weren't too bothered. We got beat two one or something. I'd scored a goal, and um, I was like devastated that we'd lost. You know, but the rest of the lads weren't that bothered, laughing and joking. And I, I thought, I'm not, I'm not good in a team sport here at all. Me, I need to be, um, I need to be on a motorbike. And, it's so you know, weird you say that because I just I mentioned before I've been playing a lot of paddle tennis, and you start to see traits in people, yeah. right? And some people are just winners, like they have to win, and their moods and everything changes afterwards. And 
they started to impact me a little bit being around those type of people. And I'm starting to think, yeah. am I a bit like that? Or, but at the same time, is where do you think that winning mentality comes yeah, from? Yeah, I don't know where it came from. I really don't. I'm just the fear of losing. I hated losing. And uh, and I wasn't like naturally talented like, like you asked. I was just, I was so determined. I'd learn from others where I was slower, what style I needed to use. I'd get my knee out a bit further, get, get in the corners harder, you know, just, just go off the, the guys that were winning and, and try and learn from them. And I picked up things from... From not from not winning races, obviously early on, I, but and I started winning quite early, really, on the two fifties, two fifty Grand Prix bike. I was I was winning races, you know, fairly quickly in international level in in nineteen eighty six when my first full season was eighty four, and um, then I had a big crash, broke my leg really badly, and that set me back a couple of years. Then really, to be honest, and then I broke it again the year after. So I was in the wilderness for. A few years, I was like 21, 22, when I should have been like, you know, really pushing for riding the Grand Prix and stuff. Wow, um, so you just got started, you found your love for the sport, mm. and then you've already kind of come across two big injuries quite early yeah. on. I had a massive crash at, at Alton Park, um, practicing for the next round of the British Championship, so I was really pumped up to win this race at, at Alton Park. It's my home track. I just finished 11th in the British Grand Prix, having begged for, I had to beg for a ride, basically. And, and I, I, everyone was talking about me like being the next kind of pro good prospect for, for Grand Prix racing. And I was being spoken to by Chas Mortimer who run the Silverstone Armstrong team in Grand Prix about replacing Neil McKenzie. And I was all, it was all good and that, you know, I was brought up four lap records in four weekends. And then so I got to Alton Park, testing on the Tuesday. I've got to fa found some old tyres that my dad hadn't used from slick, slick, slick tyres from when he was racing. And should never probably uh, put them in the bike. It was just uh, the... They were, they were that hard, they were like plastic to be honest, the tyres. And uh, just crashed on the first lap, on the second lap, high sided, really, <clears throat> really high, and come down. Just my leg was facing the other way. I was just, oh, that happened to me. Pulled myself off that the track. Happened to and me. I was just led to look at my leg facing oh. that way, and the pain set in. I was like, oh, no, this is not good. Oh, um, it's just yeah. took me back. I literally, that, I went to, um, there's an off road motor um, bike track in, is it Southport? South, yeah, yeah, yeah. South yeah. Lake, something like yeah. that. Uh, and uh, I got hit by a bike. Leisure my, Park. Leisure, that's leisure it. Park. Leisure and my, my, le my, my knee was that way and my foot was that way. And when mm. I say to you, Carl, the pain that I was in, right, I've never felt pain like it. When you go through that level of pain, do you become a little bit more immune to it when you're a biker? I feel like, <laughs> or was it just... No, it was just, it was horrible pain to be honest. I just felt sick and I was just crawled off the track. And so then I was in hospital for like nine weeks on, wow. on traction uh, with a pin through kind of my shin bone. With some weights holding it kind of straight on for for like eight or nine weeks it was, it was That's just a long horrendous, time. you know. I mean, back then, even it should have really been pinned to be honest. I should have been up and about within a week or two, but um, they said it was too close to the knee with the femur, a compound fracture of the femur. It was quite close to the knee to, to pin it at the time, but I didn't really see the top specialist really. I couldn't, I, don't know, I couldn't really afford nine to. Nine weeks in hospital yeah, for a broken leg. Nine weeks on traction, yeah, yeah. So someone like you then, that must have been really testing like mentally. Like, do you feel like these kind of... I've kind of got used to it at the end. I just thought, this is my home now. This is where I live. And it, when, when I came to leave the hospital, I was like, I don't want to go out to the real world anymore. This is, this is, really? like, this is like where I, I belong and where I live, you know. It was a horrible feeling, yeah. It was... It was bizarre, but just to be led there for, for the weeks. I mean, I don't know how, it, how the hell I did it because I can't keep still anyway. And for me to have to be still for like eight weeks, I think it was. Eight, I can't remember if it was eight to nine weeks, to be honest. But um, yeah, it was not good at all. So not you good. broke your leg once and then you said you did it again the year later? Well, they, they took the, the pin out of the shin bone, um, the bone here, sorry, under, under, under my knee when I was on traction. And it had got infected once it took the pin out. The bone had got infected. So I had a soft crash at Silverstone the year after when it was the second round of the British Championships. I won the first round on the 250. Second round, I was just a soft fall in the wet and it just snapped. And I just thought, oh my God, I broke my leg again, you know. Um, and the, the pain wasn't as bad this time. But, um, but it, um, they said, look, it's, they'd gone in and said, look, the bone's been infected from where they took the pin out. So I had to scrap a lot, scrap a lot of bad bone out. And then put me on an external fix, fixation, um, and so that was that was another. Uh, I just injury. can't believe that this is your life, like in terms. I know. Of, it was, and, you and, just talk about it like it's just like everyday stuff. This is this work, and it's just. Uh, yeah, and the doctors were saying at the time he, he never thought about giving up this bike racing. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm going to be world champion. I've got to be world, you know. And it, for one sort of minute there, there, I was thinking, oh my god, maybe I'm. I've, I've dreamt of being a world champion, determined and focused, and. 
being a world champion and really isn't this, you know, is it going to happen now sort of thing? You know, almost took a year out of racing in, in 88. Um, so that was your goal then? You always kind of visualised being world yeah, champion? Yeah, I was just so believed. I would tell anybody it would listen to me even from a young age, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a world champion in motorcycle racing. I don't know if I actually believed it myself. I just said said it because it sounded <laughs> clever or cocky or whatever when I was a kid. But I do actually think I believed it, to be honest. I think I did believe it. Um and then anyway, it came true, to be honest. It came true the year after that, when I, my first year of bike after breaking my leg twice in 88 was when I moved to the bigger bikes and I felt like I could move on these bigger bikes and more room because of the injuries to, to my leg, restricting my movement in my, in my leg on the 250s. So, so you get on a big 750 Honda, I was like, oh, great, this is great. I feel, I feel, I feel like, you know, I can, I'm dead comfortable on the bike and I can, I can ride our road before I, got, I brought the legs, you know. Wow, and, that's so but, interesting though, but the... I've been obviously doing a lot of research into like successful businessmen, sports people, and else. And it's just that relentlessness in terms of not giving up, not quitting. Most people after they broke the leg twice would be like, you know what, yeah. I'm done there. And that could be the end of the career. But yeah. for you, the fact that you have found the strength to go again, and it was that the following year that you became world champion, it's just like testament to that kind of tenacity See, my, that you've my got. My inner belief and just determination and, and just you know arrogance, I guess, in a lot of ways, just to to like never give in, you know, I was kind of famous for that. I'd say the same was, you know, never give in. It was like the t-shirt, the foggy t-shirt, never give in sort of thing, you know. Um, but talk to me about um, that first world title and how big was the sport when you were racing? And <clears throat> have you seen it change over time? Like, because I know that you you were racing in front of like 100,000 people at one point. Like, talk to me a little bit about that because I don't know the ins and outs of how big this sport actually was. Yeah, Superbikes became huge. It really did. Um, it was seen as a new, new, fairly new championship. It was born in 88. In the 90s, it really came, came to fruition. It was, it, it, people could buy the bikes that we were racing sort of thing. And the TV coverage was sky out of the TV coverage of it all, which they went, they did an amazing job with it. They went behind the scenes and just filmed the, the qualifying, that kind of stuff, built up the characters and, and did adverts to me and all sorts of stuff, you know. So they 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 kind of were the bigger biggest reason I think that kind of made me a household name in the UK more than anybody was was the Sky TV and the, the coverage of, of World Superbike and the crowds and the circus and the characters that were our race against the Americans and the uh, Australians who were always big rivalry, you know, were always saying this about each other and that about each other. It was like two boxers going into a fight before a fight, you know, with the, with the banter and stuff that was they were saying. And uh, yeah, it got, got quite heated at times. And uh, but yeah, it was just. Um, it what was do you just think huge. it is that people loved about the sport? Is it just like the actual like just how dangerous it was, and like you said, the characters that were involved. People just love bike racing because they love bikes. That's that's what it is, really. And they love going to watch bike racing. It's a lot more exciting. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that can happen, a lot of crashes that can happen, and people want to see that. They might not admit it, but they want to see, you know, mm -hmm. action. They'll go to a corner, like a, a tight left down the right hand corner or something, where there's going to be you know, a lot of passing and maybe some crashes and stuff, you know. That's what people want to see. It's kind of human nature to watch people, like, fail, really, and, and watch people win as well. So, but when you yeah. said they, um, they built up characters, I've heard, obviously, uh, through doing my research, that um, they kind of made you into a character that was kind of almost... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not evil. Like, evil's a bit. Evil's a bit too <laughs> far. But like to the point no. where well, didn't you have this like um, image around your eyes or some of the look that you would give to people? Because yeah, you... my eyes are a bit weird. Apparently, a bit evil eyes I've got. I don't know. I, I, I look in the mirror and think, look alright to me. But yeah, the foggy eyes and the logo, the, the trademark came from the foggy eyes from when I was sponsored by No Fear as a, a little bit as well. Um, and what was the logo? It was just my eyes, just um, just like a, just, I don't know. I've, I've got it on my shoulder. Oh, there, oh okay. Wow. <laughs> foggy eyes, yeah. So just the evil eyes so, kind of thing. So I was, I'm once right, the eyes focusing on something, they, they never let go, you know. I'm right in thinking that you kind of wanted to win at all costs. And you almost, yeah. I'm right in thinking you also almost wanted to hate your competitors. <sighs> In yeah, order to did, make sure yeah. that you had that edge. I did, yeah. I look back now I'm a bit cringe as to why I was like I was. I was wasn't a nice person to be around, and probably Michaela could <laughs> vouch for that as, as well. I wasn't an easy person to be around. I was that focus on winning, and yeah, anyone who got close to me, I would kind of sort of lash out a little, a little bit, a, a, a diss them or something, or go on about their bike or about them, and yeah, or name my pot belly pigs after them or, or whatever. You know, I just. Um, yeah, I was just, I look back and think, why did I not just keep my mouth shut and just race the bike and 
focus on racing. I took took a lot less pressure off me to to win rather than saying I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm the best, I'm going to win. You know, I think why did I keep saying so much stuff? Was like that, that not you know? part of your strategy though to it, win? It just was, yeah. I just you know I don't I don't regret how I was because it was it was how I had to be my makeup. I had to be to to be a winner really. You know, by putting others down, I suppose, and getting in their heads a little bit. You know. Um, if you do like study like winners like Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, I don't know, Conor McGregor, they've all got that kind of um, attack mode in them. Killer in terms, instincts. Yeah, them. killer instincts. And, and they like to get inside the head of their, yeah. um, their opponents <clears throat> and stuff like that. So it definitely is a strategy um, yeah. because sometimes you can beat someone before they even go on, onto the racetrack. Do you, did you ever find that? I think that's that? probably what I was trying to do really, you know, get inside their heads a little bit. Um, I used to do it <clears throat> with quite a lot of riders every year. Whoever was my main rival, I would, you know, try and sort of get in their heads a little bit, really. And, and uh, I don't know if it, it worked or not. I really don't know. But um, I kind of wish I'd not said so, so many things as I did say, to be honest. But it was just how I was. Uh, I was so determined to, to be to be winning, uh, wanting to win, that I would just diss anybody that sort of, <clears throat> you know, got near me or anything like that, you know, and really sort of verbally attack them, which, you know, wasn't the sort of, that brightest thing to do. Really. When you said before that not many people could get close to you then, and you and so that element of you it wasn't really a performance. It was something you actually believed in. You just didn't really want to have loads of people around you or you're just so focused on winning in your own kind of yeah, lane. Yeah, I wasn't even aware that was well known, to be honest. It was the fame thing. And I've never really, I've always struggled with that, really, to be honest. I didn't even know I was famous until I'd retired from racing and, I remember going down to London and everyone recognised me and knew who I was. I was like, oh, what's all this about? You know, it's... Oh, because you didn't go out much, weird. I didn't really go out much at all. Just, just kind of hid away in, in the countryside in Blackburn and, and I didn't really didn't go out, to be honest. I didn't really drink or anything like that at all. So it was... Um, yeah, it was always hard for me with it on the fame side of things um, to, 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 to accept it, really. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really handle it, to be honest. But uh, In what way, though? Because <clears throat> you I was didn't a bit like shy any... with it yeah. all, really. I didn't think I was... I was worthy of, of being labelled sort of famous person, you know. I just thought that was people off off TV, like in in Corrie or, or Emmerdale or something like that. Back then, not an EastEnders, not 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 somebody who raced a bike, you know. And when you got in in circles with these these people, like they they all like were in awe of, of me, a sort of kind of thing. Oh my God, you're foggy, you're racing. What? Like, well, you know me? You're such a body from yeah. Corrie or something like that, you know. It was weird. Um, yeah, it was just really strange trying to. Get me head around it all, really. I, I never really, I just never really knew, took notice of the, the you know, the, the outside of of the racing circle. That everyone, that people knew who I was. You know, it was weird. so when you were trying to win the world titles, then what were you trying? What were you trying to win it for? Just for the sport, or because obviously, I think with winning those titles and how big the sport came, obviously financial success came, the fame came as well. Was that really like a byproduct? It was actually the sport that you wanted to win. Yeah, it was just it was just wanting to win. I would just love racing bikes, and more important, I love winning on on bikes. So, and I just I never really thought about the, the other part, the money. I thought, well, the money will take care of itself. If I win races, then I'll get paid good money. Um, you know, by the best teams or the top teams, and and the fame thing. I ne I never really thought about it. I didn't. I, I forgot all about that. To be honest, I didn't. I didn't do it to be famous. I did it just. Because I wanted to race bikes and win races, you know, win world championships. But then, then we're doing interviews and TV stuff, and it's like, oh my god, I, I, I I'm not really that comfortable with all this, really. You know, it's. Um, Did you it's see all... the sport change as well over time in terms of obviously it became a lot bigger whilst you were involved in it, but also like like the financial gains and everything else. Did that massively change? Because I'm guessing when you first started, it wasn't yeah. about it wasn't really well funded or anything else. No, it wasn't. No, it was it was expensive sports to get started off. In. <clears throat> my dad helped. Helped me out a little bit with with getting us the first bike and stuff. Uh, his, his company helped helped to help me sponsor me. P and G Fogarty, haulage company in Blackburn. Um, but yeah, the changes yeah came obviously once once I started winning races and doing well, and I got signed by Honda, uh, Honda Britain to to race them for a couple of years, and then obviously when Ducati. So then the contracts come and with, with the money was bigger and bigger every year because it was the the, the 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 series was getting bigger and bigger. Um, mm -hmm. It was. More lucrative, and obviously the the contracts are bigger, so the money mm. came. Yeah, was... someone I want to talk about is your dad because you mentioned him a couple of times, um, and obviously I know how close you are with um, Danielle and Claudia. Like, what was your relationship like with your dad? Was he not a pushy dad? Then he was kind of no, my dad wasn't really. 
when I was racing, it really did help me a lot for, for a lot of years. You would, you know, help write letters to potential sponsors, that kind of stuff. And it always came to every race. I'd even sleep in my leathers night before races. I remember stretching a little bit when the when I had a new set of leathers and stuff like that. You know, look after the kids and you know when they were younger at, uh, at the racetracks and that with my mum. So uh, yeah, he was he was always there. He was my biggest fan. He still is my biggest fan to be fair. Yeah. Oh, amazing! Still wears a foggy t-shirt on most days. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So you, so you won your first world title. Then you went on to win another three. How was that? Was it was it kind of plain sailing from that point? Did you have any more bumps in the road? Yeah, I had a few bumps in the road, really. I, I, I won the first Superbike title and backed it up, winning again the year after. And then I found myself a little bit, I don't know, I just, I, I struggling for motivation and, a, and a, a bit, it wasn't quite right in the head a little bit, really. I, I, I wanted to change teams. I broke up a winning team at Ducati, the best bike, best team, everything, really. To go to Honda, back to Honda again, which, you know, if if I could have my career again, I wouldn't do that. I would have stayed with Ducati and I would have won two more world titles. I'm pretty sure So why sure did you do that then? I don't really know if I'm honest. I just thought the Honda looked strong. It really did look strong. It was my old team. They, they were much more professional. Um, everything was really well organised at Honda. Was it Ducati? It was really disorganised, to be fair. It really was disorganised, but... Once I got to back to Honda, I got more money as well to go to Honda as well. And I got a free car and I got a free motocross bike, things like that. I just, you know, <laughs> my eyes open, that kind of thing. Um, but once I got there, I just thought, I don't even want to be here now. I've, I feel like I was back at school to wear the right shirts all the time, that kind of thing. And um, I was just like a number at Honda, one of many. But was at Ducati, it was all about me. I was, I was the main guy, you know. I was, you know, I'd go out for dinner with the boss of Ducati and stuff like that. It was with Honda, you would never see the boss of Honda in Japan or anything like that. But, and the bike didn't really suit my style of riding. Well, it was a very fast bike and I nearly did win. I nearly did win the world championship to be fair. I came fourth, but I went down to the last round with still a mathematical chance of winning it. But I came out fourth and, and I made a decision to go back to Ducati. They took me back to be fair. So, but when I went back, things had changed so much that it took me a year or two to, to win the world championship again, really. And I, I not broke up that winning team in 95, I believe I would have won easily in 96 and then and getting 97. But it cost me two years by leaving Ducati and going to Honda. And then I didn't get the title back until 98. And even that year, I was, I was quite lucky to get it back, mm. really. I was a bit inconsistent. Really, so do, you, but, yeah. do you think you got kind of attracted by the shiny lights and it kind of... I did a bit, yeah. And and I shouldn't have done that, really. I shouldn't. You know, it was one thing I do regret is, is, is signing for Honda and not and leaving Ducati and break up that winning team. Should, because you've got a great relationship with Ducati, haven't you? They've, yeah. named, they've named motorbikes after you and everything, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, they've done a few foggy replicas and, and stuff. And hey, I'm back with them now, really. And, you know, I should, they've took me back and obviously everything, everything I've done to them, <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> they have in some ways. But no, it's nice that um, people remember me from, from riding, riding the Ducati. I was, I kind of helped them became famous as well, really. Me and, and the 916 was just that most iconic bike of all time. And, the success I had on that bike, the winning the world championships, and, and Ducati went were going through a bit of a, a tough time at that time, really selling bikes, and so it all came together really nicely mm. with my name and, and Ducati's name, and uh, yeah, it's the sort of rest is history, as they say, really. But just talking about moments like that, having like motorbikes named after you, like building up huge brands like Ducati and stuff like that. What do you ever take a step back? and appreciate what you've actually achieved. Do you ever feel proud of what you've done? I think I do now, yeah. I do now mm. it's, you know, when I've just had my house done up at home and had the, had the big sort of party room, sort of done bar room, pool table. All the pictures are around the wall and stuff of, of different eras of my racing career. And I look back and think, I did all right, didn't I really? Amazing. <laughs> I did all right, you know. I, I, so I'm quite proud of, of the fact that I've, you know, things like winning the TT and then going on to be a world champion on the short circuit, because that's something nobody will ever do again. I was the last person to, to do it and it won't happen again. So things like that I'm really proud of, you know. But, um, yeah, the, the winning the world titles in, in endurance and TTF1 and World Superbike. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible, really, uh, the races that I won. So, yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite proud of the fact that I'm still here as well, to be honest. Yeah, me, I didn't honestly, expect to be here until... <laughs> you should be so proud, and I've been to your house as well. It's beautiful, and obviously your family's amazing, but we'll go on to that more in, in, in a minute. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about your style of racing as well, um, because... From what I've what I've read, you were really kind of fearless in terms of the, the way that you actually attacked 
um, the racing track and you, you were known for going really, is it really like, I don't know, low to the corner? Corners? Corner, my corner speed was was my main strength, really. I was very aggressive rider, but my corner speed my, from 250 racing, I think, came from there that I, I, I just let go of the brakes and the tr transition from letting go of the brakes to getting on the gas was immediate with me to carry the, the corner speed through the mid corner. And that's just them little tents on every corner, you know, I would, you know, make me have the best lap or, the, or win the race sort of thing. So... That was my, my main strength was the corner speed that I would carry, my lean angle and corner speed, yeah. When the bike was working well and the tires were working well, then, yeah, I could I could do that to, the, to better than anybody, you know. Yeah. Would you say you were fearless? I was, yeah. No, I was fearless, yeah. I was probably a bit, probably a bit stupid, really. I, you know, I'd just, um, yeah, not been the most intelligent person when I was racing. I, I, I just wanted to go faster and faster and faster, you know. If somebody went faster, I'd go out and try and go faster than them sort of thing and not really think about setting the bike up better to, to, to do that, you know, just go and r ride with me on my heart and, and just try and, try and go faster than them, you know, just be braver sort of thing, yeah. And do you think that links back to wanting to win so badly? Yeah, it was, yeah. I hated losing. Um, it got worse and worse. The the the, the, um, the obsession with winning, just, you know, I was just, it was just mental. I mean, at the end, it, you know, I was, I was the pressure put myself under and the expectation. See, the fans expected me to win, the press did, everybody did, and... You know, when it was all over, I was like so relieved to be honest. Uh, when I threw the injury I sustained in in 2000, which which you know obviously wiped me out, and I was lucky to be alive. To be fair, and then the shoulder were never going to be right after that. And I announced my retirement, and I remember it being you know going on the on these the Sky News kind of video printer going across the bottom call for I'm like, oh my God, I'm not, I didn't even know anybody had noticed, to be honest. It's going, you know, Carl Fogarty, World Superbike Champions, retired from racing. It's on the radio and TV and stuff and the fax machine's going mad. I'm like, I don't like, what's all this fuss about? You know, it's just, I'm just retired, but... Um, oh, so you had a really bad injury again, didn't you, in 2000? Yeah, Is that yeah, right? That was it, yeah. That finished me off that, did Yeah, my shoulder's still not right. It's just lost strength and movement in it. And the position you need to be in to race super bikes, I couldn't get down in that position anymore. So, so you know what I think the decision really, was made for really me. Really interesting when you talk about these injuries. Like, you don't even seem to, like... I like When I talk about, when I went through that pain and that, that moment... I, I just, I can't really even talk about where you just kind of talk about it. Like, yeah, it was, it was more about the injury rather than the crash. You don't really talk about the crash. Yeah. You just talk about the injury. It was almost like it was just a hindrance to what you wanted to do. <laughs> like, you don't even mention the crash. Like, were you not scared? Were you not thinking this could but be it? I, I, I didn't even know. You know what? It's the only crash I have no memory of, the one that finished me off. I just, I remember waking up and hearing a hel helicopter noise and I was in and out of consciousness. I was, I'd, I'd, I'd crashed in a position where you wouldn't normally crash. I clipped another rider in front of me. When I was coming through the field after getting a bad start, and I hit, I hit a tire wall and it was ricocheted off the tire wall. It went in with my head and my shoulder, which took the impact. I knocked myself out and I'd sort of bruising on the brain and and, and that. And but yeah, I, I had no memory of it, so I, I I couldn't get scared of something I have no memory of. To be honest, um, it's only crash. You, know, you only see it on my on board um, on the bike as well. Really, and you think why have I, I clipped this guy? But apparently he was having a big problem with his bike and he pulled off the racing line. And his bike had cleared and he came back on the racing line again. As I was coming up really quickly behind him, it just shows me clip him. I've just, I don't know why I've clipped him, but I have. And then gone off and hit the wet grass and hit the tire wall. And yeah, the rest is. Have you ever been scared? Um, I'm just scared of not winning, really. <laughs> that was, I wasn't scared. No, probably the TT a little bit in the last time I did the TT when I had, I had the, the young one uh, with Danielle and stuff. And I, I kind of gone back for the wrong reasons a little bit in some ways, but I wanted to put the record straight from the, the year before I'd done the TT91, which I'd, I'd gone back and did the one race and shared the bike with another rider. And it wasn't ideal. We had problems in the race with the bike. So I wanted to go back and, and put it right. And I guess I did in some ways by getting the absolute lap record and finishing second, which was stood for seven years, you know. But um, no, I... I I think that did cross my mind a little bit there. The TT, I was a little bit scared. Of, but once the, 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 the flag had dropped, then I was no, mm. there was no fear at all then, you know. And I hope you don't mind me saying this because I know Michaela's in the room. But, like, you must have had conversations amongst yourselves, like, going, saying, obviously, when you, when you had the girls, like, in terms of, is it worth it putting yourself in those situations? But I know the answer already because I know what bikers are like. It's mm. like, you might, <clears throat> am I right in thinking that without racing, you wouldn't ever feel alive at that point. Yeah, I mean, it was it never crossed my mind to to, to retire uh, really because we had we had kids. In fact, it made me 
want to race more and race harder to, to, to add more mouths to feed, didn't I? You know, I had to, I had to get my finger out and earn some, earn some money, really. Uh, so, no, on the short circuits, that, that never, it never entered my head, to be honest. No, it didn't. So, I, it, at the end of the end of 99, when I won again for the fourth time in World Superbike, I did sort of get questioning and thinking, oh, I've got the motivation to do this again. And I got injured then over during winter skiing on my shoulder. Then I crashed in testing and injured my other shoulder. I had to race the first race in 2000, injured, and to pick up a third place in, in the first race in South Africa. Then the second race, it was like, okay, he's not listening to me here. Some, some whatever, divine in intervention with, with my shoulder, this one then, but this one, then it's like, he's not listening to us here. So boom, finished me off with a proper shoulder injury. And, 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 the, and the third time I, I got a short shoulder injury that winter, really. And that was it. It was not coming back from that. It was like someone's trying to tell me something just to maybe give up now. Or something. I don't know, but. Mm -hmm. um, so you're literally a miracle sat here in front of us with the amount of races that you've, that you've raced in and everything that you've achieved. Yeah. Um, so I think you actually are a living miracle. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you are still here. So it's just six weeks now to my first ever sprint triathlon in Sunderland. And I know so many of you have been training hard, but this is the time now to level up, to step things up and make sure your training is on point. And just something to look out for is your transitions. That's the period between each discipline. So you do swimming, biking and running, and you need to make sure your transition between each one is super crisp. You can get some advice on the Training Peaks app. You can watch YouTube clips and speak to some coaches out there as well, but make sure you give that a little focus because that can make the massive difference in your time. So anyway, I can't wait to see you all on the 29th of July. Keep training hard and let's do this together. But in terms of um, big milestones as well, you are now an MBE. Like, MBE, yeah. More cycling's best ever. It does. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what? A massive bell end, as we met, would say. <laughs> that is huge, though. So did you have to yeah. go down to meet the Queen? Yeah, yeah, I got the, met, met the Queen, yeah. She, she put the, the medal on me and asked me a bit about racing. Um, go what, what did she, she say to you? Said, what, what, what kind of bike racing is it? And I went, I said, like, went that? Like racing round Brands Action and Silverstone, like that kind of shit. She just went, okay, shook, shook me on and pushed me away then after that. <laughs> that was it. I had to take my steps back, bow, turn and get out of there, you know. Uh, but yeah, it was um, it was great to get meet the, get the Queen. Yeah, that was the main one, really. You know? And what did people. your family think? Because you're such a, a lovely, local, like, humble guy to be ticking these milestones off in life. What, what was that like for your family? Yeah, it was great. I mean, yeah, Michaela came down and, and my dad and my, my mum... Uh, and the, with Danielle, she, we, she went in because um, Claudia was too young to probably go in. I could only have four tickets, I think, to, to go in. Um, so, yeah, they were really proud. Obviously, I was really proud. Yeah, it was um, something I didn't expect, you know. Uh, there's a trip to Buckingham Palace. In, it was a while ago now. It was back in 1998. So it was, uh, it was quite a while ago, yeah. Amazing. So, and what's it like having, obviously, I know Michaela is in, in, in the studio, but like obviously I've seen your relationship and it's just unbelievable. I just want to be part of your family. You have the <laughs> best family. And I'm not just yeah. saying that. And you two have just got a, an amazing bond. Like what's it been? And, and she's obviously been really? there. She's, you know, she's been there through <laughs> like the toughest times yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in your life. There's not many people who could put up with that like and, and go through that. What's it been like having that that person in your yeah, life? Yeah, you you need that person really to enjoy the good times, but also, you know, the bad times are, are, are quite often as well, really. And for that shoulder to cry on and someone to give you a lift up when when things aren't going too good and you're other side of the world and you just crashed again and or whatever, you know, it's um, yeah. I mean, I I don't really appreciate as as as, as much probably that I should that what she actually went through really and being on the sidelines that. Because I was that focused and wrapped up in myself, thinking about myself all the time, that didn't really think too much about the others, you know, Michaela in particular, who was going through as much, if not more, than what I was going through, really. And it wasn't until I'd, I'd finished racing and retired from racing that I kind of appreciated her a lot more, what she put up with, with the person I was, that would bring the racing home with me. And it was never really a... You know, a time when I wasn't thinking about racing, yeah. So. Bringing a racing home. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine the I can imagine the mood swings. <laughs> yeah, um, there's quite a few. But how did you meet as well? I'm really intrigued actually. How did you meet? Well, she was a mate of my sister's from school. Right. So my sister brought her home from school and I thought, oh, she looks all right. <laughs> <laughs> um I was only I was fourteen or fifteen, fourteen maybe. I think Club Mercal would have been thirteen. 
And so I, I knew her then, and I kind of, I kind of probably had a bit of a crush on her then, but I would never admit it. I would just sort of fight with her and stuff like that, and just <laughs> outside and rub soil in her face and squirt fairy liquid in her eyes, and or throw a wellies in the stream or something that or went from a treehouse. Yeah, I just wouldn't admit that I fancied her at all. But then uh, I didn't see her for quite a few years after that, and then I saw her in a in a pub in uh, when I was twenty. I was twenty two, I think she was twenty one. And in a, a pub in Blackburn called the Woodlands Arms, which was always a popular place to go on a Thursday night. And uh, her mate come over and said, oh, you, do you remember um, Michaela, Michaela Bond? I went, oh, yes, yeah. so I thought she were dead <laughs> like that. I don't know why I said that. I said, no, oh, she's over here. Are you buying her a drink or what? And, and she, I remember she had the silly hat on. I thought, oh, she looks so sorry. <laughs> and uh, so I bought her a drink and uh, she kind of bullied me and poking me. Oh, what are you looking, looking like? like Carl Fogg, what happened to you then? Uh, still racing men bikes and all that kind of stuff. Being a bit cocky. She was quite a confident person, Michael. I was quite shy. Oh, you shy. wouldn't be able to tell that, would you? Um, I said, oh, do you, want to, do you want to go out for lunch tomorrow? Yeah, lunch, you can buy me lunch. Yeah, yeah. So I no <laughs> bought my mum's car, my mum's white um, Cabriolet XR3 and went for lunch to the Bull's Head. And, uh, yeah. So how long has it been uh, now then? So that was, I think, 35 years ago that was. Wow. Um, we'd been married 32. So it was probably 87, Christmas 87, we started going out uh, with each other. Um, yeah, so. Would like you say that she's years. your soulmate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah she's my mate. Yeah, she's yeah. best mate. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? It's, oh, it's amazing because it's so rare, like, to see people like you two and to see that chemistry you've got and that support you've got for each other and how that then extends into your family as well. Like, when you're around you guys, you just feel that. And I think it's rare. And and, and when, I, when I use the word soulmate, I use it with, like, in the nicest way possible because I think it is really rare to have what you guys have got. Um, yeah, we get on well. We have, we have moments. <laughs> of course. That's part, we'll of, well. that's part of life. Yeah. And in terms of like your life now, has it been hard adjusting from going out there, racing in front of thousands of people, having all this press attention, the buzz and, and, and that competitive nature that you've got? Has it been hard adjusting to the slow lane, so to speak? <sighs> Not really, no. I kind of, I don't really miss it really. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm in, I'm in the slow lane really, as you, as you say. Um, no, it just doesn't really. I didn't need to replace that need for going faster, you know, 170, 80 mile an hour down a straight anymore. I just, it'd be quite easy just to go off fishing or something, mate. It wouldn't bother me, you know. Um, Wait a second. So, I've seen you come through parties, right? And the wedding <laughs> on, on um, a Ducati bike, right? So you still got a little bit of. Uh... I still ride like for fun and stuff, you know. I still I still love getting out on the bikes, on the dirt bikes, and off me off, me off road bikes, enduro bikes, and that. And, mountain bike and going quick on them but i don't feel like i'd I, I, I do it to replace what i, I can't do anymore at, r r at road racing i just do it because i, I kind of love you know the thrill of kind of going still quite quick on a bike really yeah um do so you feel like you've got it all out of your system now <laughs> i've got it yeah i think so yeah i think i have yeah definitely yeah absolutely my my, my body's that broken and, and it aches in it with pain most days with my knee and my, my neck and my, my ankle it's the, the thought of being in a position to to race a bike again just fills me with dread with the, the pain my body's in you know with the aches and pains i've got from injuries from from racing you know yeah yeah and then so, so obviously now you've got the most beautiful family with the girls Talk, talk to me about your relationship with the girls and how that kind of that's kind of changed your life. Oh, I'm just dad, really. Just 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 in the background and doesn't really do much at all, really. Apart from annoying the kids every now and again, and you know, wind Claudia up and she winds me up. Um, but yeah, they did both done well for themselves. They, they, they're two great kids. Um, yeah, beautiful much, girls as well. Very much homely kind of home home sort of girls, really. Like they've been home of the family. Um, yeah, Danielle's obviously got, and Claudia got the sister stories brand and stuff that they, they, they do okay with. Um, Danielle's obviously married and with little one, another one on the way. So she's very much family in, in Torite, and family orientated, orientated <laughs> yeah, with a little one on the way and stuff at any, any, any day now as well. And you're, Claudia's, you're a granddad now. I'm a granddad, yeah. Granddad Carl the Fogarty. Fastest granddad in the world on two wheels still. <laughs> What's it like being a granddad? I don't mind. It's just that word, granddad. It's horrible, really. But I, I don't, have you I got like a nickname, it, you know? Pops, or anything like that? No, is, nothing. Is, no, is no. Mikhail doesn't like grammar at all. She hates it. Wow. Uh, 
<laughs> but no, I don't really mind it too much. But um, but yeah, it's great with the little one now, and yeah, you can, it's good when when you're my age now and stuff, and you can play with them and stuff, and then give them back when they start crying or making a mess and making a smell sort of thing, and give them back to mummy and daddy sort of thing. Mm. But, uh, I just think like there's not many people I look at and go, you know what, you've lived like a, a first rate life, you've achieved so much, but then you've you've got like a beautiful family, you've created a nice life, a beautiful life for yourself as well. It seems like amongst all the craziness and the madness, you've had balance as well, which is, I think, which is rare. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. to have a family life, a lot of people achieve the greatest things in life. They don't necessarily sometimes have the family life in check or anything else, or sometimes having a good like woman by your side helps you achieve those great things. Whereas I used to think in my life that, all right, when I get to this milestone, that's when I might get a family or I might meet someone or something like that. When in actual fact, it seems like, having Michaela by your side and your family as giving you that support to achieve those things. Yeah, I mean, the way the way, when you, the way you say it then, it sounds like I've, I've got a great life and I have a great life. Um, I just, I think I need to hear that sometimes, you know, or I need to tell myself that because I suffer quite badly with, with anxiety and I get depressed and stuff. And, you know, and I think what I've got around me, it should never be like that, you know. Uh, I've, I've no, no money worries, no family worries and... It's got a great family, great house, and blah blah blah. And yeah, it's you know I need to probably keep telling myself, look in the mirror every morning, and tell myself, you know, it's a it's a, yeah, a great today's you know, a great day and stuff. Do you know what? Know? God, I can kind of relate to that a little bit in terms of like, I mean, I struggle with my mental health on a daily basis, right? In terms of I'm not like I'm not depressed, but I wake up and it's like I have to talk myself round. Mm. Like this morning, I woke up all groggy, and I was like, then I was thinking, I'm going to do a podcast with a legend. I've got a great life. I've got a beautiful dog. I'm secure. What am I moaning about? Like, and, and, But it's hard because I'm trying to figure out what it is. Is it today's society that we live in where everything's so fast paced and we're distracted? Like when you talk about having anxiety and depression, where, where do you think that comes from? Do I've had it quite a few years, to be honest. It's probably as worse now as it's ever been. Um, and I've just kind of learned to accept that that's how I am. That's how it is for me, really. You know, I'm talking about it helps a little bit. And, me being outdoors and taking the dogs down to the river and going mountain biking definitely helps. It clears my head a little bit with doing things outdoors. But it's got it's got worse in, over the over the years. Um, I've been on the medication thing a couple of times with the doctors with sertraline, citalopram, whatever it is, and it's, nothing's ever worked really for me at all. Um, so I kind of almost accepted this is how it is. Really, I guess wake up with anxiety and you know it, I guess it gets me down a lot of times, but. You know, I just I just go out with my mountain bike or take the dogs out or, or just speak to my cow about it and it it, it, it kind of makes it a little bit easier. But it, it does seem that everybody you speak to suffers in similar similar to um to, to I to me really and I don't understand why. Um I feel like I got worse since I had COVID for some reason. In the summer of twenty twenty, um I felt like I got really, really bad then after I've got over COVID. Um it seemed to be Met me, I just got really anxious that summer. I don't know why. I really enjoyed the first lockdown and stuff like that. I really loved it. It was great. I was outdoors. The sun wow, was shining every day. I was out on my bikes. I was doing daft stuff and daft videos and loving it. And all of a sudden, I just, just like a switch like that, I just went into this anxious state in, in the summer of 2020. Um, and yeah, it's been struggling ever since, to be honest. Yeah. Listen, I'm a therapist, but something just hit me then. And, and I hope you don't mind me saying this. Um, like men of your generation, not to put you in a different generation, but it's like, and obviously younger than my dad, but you don't talk about how you feel, how you feel or emotions or anything like that. And lockdown, one thing it does, right? It forced everybody to spend more time on their own, mm. right? When you're on your own, like shit comes to the surface. So I don't know if it's like, yes, it's all great at first, but then over time, because I remember, because I went sober in lockdown and... I was spending so much time in my own, it was like, fuck, it was tough, like, because so much stuff was coming up. But in a way, if you allow that stuff to come up and then talk about it with someone that you care about yeah. or whatever else. I mean, one <clears throat> strength that I've always had, Carl, like I'll go into a steam room sauna with David Lloyd and I'll talk to the random guy in there about how I'm feeling that day. I'm just, I've never had a problem with it. Mm. Whereas, would you feel like you find it difficult to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, with someone, I didn't know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been advised to go and see somebody you know to give the medication thing hasn't worked for me and go and see like a, a psych specialist is that you know to talk to and i still think oh, i just can't see it'll work for me at all i really don't but you know maybe i should give it a try i think it's one it's one thing i haven't tried really is 
you seem like a, a sort of specialist kind of, you know, yes, psychologist sort of Yeah, person, definitely really. stay open-minded. I see a therapist all the time. Yeah. Um, I've seen him for eight years now. And it's just so amazing going and speaking to someone who's kind of completely um, objective. They're not like involved in a conversation, not involved in what's ever going on. And they just make you feel at ease. Like, yeah. and they also give you a new perspective. It's like just you just mentioning then going, do you know what, when I do take a moment to take a step back and look at my life and go, I'm actually pretty proud. And, yeah, and it's that yeah. constant reminder. Yeah. Like, because yeah. you're a great guy, Kyle, and what you've done. Even is just a, is, saying what I've just said now, I instantly feel a bit better, you know. Do you know what, I've weird. seen you yeah. change throughout the conversation yeah. through, through from the start of when you came in to now. <laughs> and that is the power of talking. These podcasts are pretty much like therapy, but like, it, it just helps so much talking about it. And sometimes it can be it can be difficult going back in. That's why, in a way, I was asking about your dad a little bit because my therapist always puts everything back to my childhood. I'm like, really? I, don't, I'm like <clears throat> I don't even remember that. Why do you want to talk about that? He went, my dad wasn't around for like six years of my life. So at that point, he says to me, because he wasn't around, I was looking for love. So when you're looking for love, you become a bit of a people pleaser. Mm. And that's why I'm so motivated and, and I always um, I'm looking for validation from people on yeah, Instagram yeah. so do you know what I mean it's, <clears throat> yeah. so it's like everything links back to whatever else and I find it quite interesting mm. I think self-awareness is key um, so I think in terms of talking to someone I'd highly recommend that yeah, uh, and don't just accept that you should have anxiety every day like don't accept that because you shouldn't and mm. I think the power is in talking. It's great, great that you're already talking and uh, and getting out yeah. and, and doing stuff that's good for you. But even doing this today, because I know this has been tough for you to come in here today, and you've absolutely <laughs> couldn't be asked doing it. <laughs> nah. <laughs> well, you've absolutely you've made my day um, and you've smashed it, and and this will inspire a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but before we move on, um, let's talk about the jungle. Oh God! Yeah. 20, 2014. Yeah. Was, was it 2014? Uh, yeah, or it was 2014. 2014. Yeah, it was a while ago now. Wow. You <laughs> went on and won the biggest show on, I know, on TV. I know. I was, I, that's mad. I still can't believe it. I, I, I actually did it for a start. And, yeah, how and did they talk you into doing it? ITV just approached us. They, they approached us um, about 18 years ago. And I said, no, obviously. Um, and back then, my family kind of, oh, you should have done it, you should have done it. And anyway, I didn't I didn't do it for whatever reason. I didn't feel like I was in the right sort of, my head was in the right sort of place to do it, really. So when they came back a few, well, in 2014, um, and my manager said they wanted to do it. And I said, oh, God, I don't know. I, I kind of want to do it. And Mikhail is going, don't do it. You, you'll come across a twat and, and love it. You'll, everybody will hate you, don't do it. And I'm like, oh, thanks to the, you know, a lot of confidence. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, obviously I did it, but I mean, it took a lot of persuasion from ITV, and they they come up, they flew me down to to London and met met with the ITV bosses and stuff for the show, and then they came up to our house as well uh, a, month, a month or two later to assure me that the family would be looked after, everything be fine, you know, with with the Versace Hotel that kind of stuff. And Michaela's going, no, I don't want you to do it. Anyway, so I said yes, I'll do it, and I didn't tell Michaela, and she found out. And she didn't speak to me for about a month. It wow. was great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I did it. And I, I, I said to the manager, I said, I'm probably going to walk out of the show, you know. And he's going, please don't. I said, look, I just, I'll hate the other people in there because I'm not a, I'm not the fame thing. I'm not really the celebs, that kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll just hate somebody in there. Somebody I won't get on with. They'll think they're bigger and better than me. And I'll, I'll end up, you know, I'll, be, I'll just walk out. I know I will. Um, so my main aim was just to stay in till vote off, really. I wanted to get to vote off as I went in there. Um, but I, I think I learned a lot about myself in there, really. I thought I was not really a people person, but I found out I was a people person. I, I kind of went in there and threw myself into it after that first day or two. I had a bit more wobbling that first day. I wanted to jump out and jump over the fence sort of thing. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't hack it. Um, that first sort of 12 hours when I was in that uh, jail thing, jungle jail with... <laughs> Uh, Gemma Collins and oh my god, um, Gemma Collins was in there. Yeah, you? god, yeah, I can't remember. She was well, wow. only, only in for about three days. So she, she, I thought she ain't going to last in here. She just, she was thinking they were going to get pizzas brought in and, and sandwiches and stuff. And uh, Carl no, Fogarty, like and Gemma Collins, no. next so. side by side. Imagine <laughs> that one. And um, for the guy from Corrie, uh, Craig Charles, um, oh, Craig, Vicky, yeah. oh Vicky from Hello Hello, I forgot her name now. Uh, a girl from. From Ireland, um, a model or something from Ireland. Anyway, so I was stuck with like these people from the same sort of background, really. TV and oh, I just I just don't want to be here. Like and I'm panicking, I'm probably getting panic attacks, and they're trying to calm me down on on in, in the Bush Tucker room and give me some tablets to help calm me down or whatever. And 
anyway, I sorted myself out and then I got moved to the other a camp, the main camp, and got, I got asked through the first uh, first challenge, which is lining a pit of snakes, which I just breezed through, no problems at all. Because I knew I wasn't scared of anything in there. And um, when I came out of that first, the first thing with the, the pits, uh, the pit full of snakes, as I walk over to Anton Deck and they're going, oh, well done, you've got all the stars for the, and I went, I could feel something moving down in my shorts and there were snakes still in my shorts. Oh my God. I went, the fuck's fucking snakes still in my shorts? Oh my <laughs> and God. And he jumped back to Ant and, and like, I said, I said, he said, oh, you thought we, was, we thought you were pleased to see us, you know, it was like a horror. <laughs> and a girl came over, the, the handler of the snakes, and she went up my shorts. I said, make sure you get the right snake, girl. <laughs> and pulled it out. <laughs> and, and that was that. And I was like, kind of broke the ice and I was I was away then really. And But I just, the show was just amazing. It really was. I, you know, everybody in there got on really well with. We all got on really well. Everybody mucked in and and, and, and did stuff. And I kept the fire going. I kept, kept getting the wood. I kept boiling the water, or even cooking the rice and beans after I figured out how to do it after a few days. You know, and um, yeah. But to go the whole way through, and I thought I'd be voted out one of the first, and just to go the whole way and win the, the biggest TV show in the UK was just just mad, really, just for being an ordinary dickhead from Blackburn. You know, I just. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just be me, and that was it, really. And I, I kind of just threw myself into it and just took fun at myself. And you know, I, I just, you know, I it's, just was myself. It's such really. a unique experience, though. Being, I, I being think there. everybody thought when I was going in there, even like Macaulay, that people from racing thought it was going to be this person that he was when he was racing. This intense, focused, obnoxious, a bit arrogant sort of person, you know. And I wasn't. I'm, I always said away from racing, I was always. A lot, you know, kind of funny and, and, and you know, a bit more, I didn't take myself too seriously, really, and uh, get stuck in and, and take fun out myself and fun out of others and, 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 and do the jobs in there and, uh, and just throw myself into oh, it. Oh, so and, you, got yeah. a, you got a chance to show the other side yeah, of you. And that so, must yeah. be nice to, to get that kind of yeah. sort of acceptance from people, really. It was an amazing experience. It really, really was. I mean, I'd lost so much weight in there as well. It was, God, it was amazing. But... To go the whole way through and be crowned king of the jungle, that was that was unreal. It really was, yeah. Is that up there with some of your titles now? Yeah, it there? was really, yeah. I said at the time, it was the best thing I've ever happened to me. I think I was got a bit carried away at the time, but the you know, best thing ever happened to me was winning world championships at racing bikes. But it was it was right up there with, you know, that acceptance of, you know, the people in the UK voting you, sort of the, the, the number one sort of thing was just all on public vote was just amazing, really. It's probably acceptance for yourself as well yeah. because like knowing that, because sometimes as, as, hum, as humans, we question ourselves, are we nice people, are we good people? Yeah. And, that, and sometimes you get that kind of confirmation in an environment like that. No, it was um, it was really special. And yeah, I came out of there and it just, it it didn't change me at all. I think I changed a bit when I was racing and when I became world champion, that changed me a little bit. And not for the good reason, I got a bit cocky and a bit big headed a little bit, but this didn't, this changed me maybe more humble and more appreciative of the UK public, you know, and just walking around with a smile on my face every every day and, you know, just being nice and nice and almost pretending that I was, like, not the guy that raced anymore. And uh, then I just got sick of smiling all the time and thinking, you know, I need to start being a bit more ob obnoxious again and, and back to my old self a bit now because it's um, I'm just so happy with it and, 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 and thrilled that I'd been voted this, yeah, this, this winner of this big show, you know. It seems like it was nice for you to shed your alter ego, like almost yeah, like was, yeah. you lived up to being this yeah. alter ego, which which you had to be. It was part of your racing identity and everything else. But it sounds like it was almost like nice just to let that go and, and let everyone see the real car. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but, I mean, you've no idea what's been going on on the outside world or how the voting's going or what they're showing on TV or anything, you know. So every day it came to the vote off and they'd come into the camp and... He would go, Foggy, it's not you. He's thinking, oh, God, another day, you know. And when I got to the final, I thought, oh, I've come third. I've come third, you know. Not even thought I'm going to win it. I mean, I, my, my career was all about winning. This was never about winning. This show was just about surviving it to, to vote off for me, you know. And So when it came to the last two, I thought, well, I've come second. I can't believe it. And for the winner, Foggy, I just dropped to my knees. My knees just went. I just thought, oh, my God, this is ridiculous, you know. Wow. This is mental, yeah. Amazing. Well, well deserved, man. <laughs> but on, honestly, Carl, like, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I have. Yeah, it's um, been great. And you are everything that I knew you would be in terms of you're just a lovely guy. You've achieved so much. And um, you're a legend. You are like a British <laughs> legend. Legend these days. And you definitely are the biggest name that I've had on this podcast. And I'm very grateful. And I'm grateful to be part of your family's lives as well with the girls and everything else. And yeah, let's just, um, let's stay close and make sure you keep talking as yeah, well. Yeah, I will do, mate. Amazing. Thank Cheers, you so mate. much. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Scott. Thank you. 
Oh, do you know what? It's so nice to see Carl come in a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous, and then just slowly but surely open up. And you could see him really enjoying himself. And so he should do because he's just a legend. He's achieved so much. And I know just by talking today, it will help him as well, especially with his mental health, because it is so important to talk. And I know I've taken so much from that conversation. And I hope you have too. And I just want to say a massive thank you for everybody who continues to support this podcast, whether you're rating, reviewing, subscribing, it really does make a massive difference. And please continue to DM me. I, I reply to you guys all the time. I share some of your outtakes. It means a lot. And yeah, next week, I'm going to be back with another incredible guest, but just a massive shout out to Carl Fogarty. This guy is a living legend. And for him to even come into the studio means so much. So thank you. And thank you to you as well. And I will see you next week for another life lesson.